It's a pleasure to be here. You guys are the elite, you know that? How do I know that you're the elite? Because you're here at this early hour in the morning. So thank you for coming and it is a pleasure and an honor for me to be here as well. Now the question is, why are you here? And the answer I hope is to discover high velocity ways to get more customers who will pay more money more often. If that's why you're here, say with enthusiasm, yes, Jim. Yes, Jim. All right. You're small but powerful. You're Delta Force. I get it. You know, you're good. All right. So that's what we're all here for. But who am I and why should you pay attention to anything that I say? <laughs> well, there's a lot of reasons for that and I could read through them, but I'm not going to. I'll leave them up there for just long enough. I do have, uh, I'm the author of a few things. I've got a nifty, a cool new book, at least I think it's cool. It's called How to Market Your Crap When the Economy's in the Toilet. And actually it's not that new. There's actually a second edition coming out within the next month or two. And it's called How to Market Your Crap While the Economy's Still in the Toilet. <laughs> so, are you feeling that way? I mean, are we done? Are we done with the recession? I mean, do you, do you feel like it's, we're coming out of it? Everybody who thinks the recession is over, say yes, Jim. Yes, 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 yes. A considerably different uh, level of enthusiasm, isn't there, there? Because, uh, yeah. Now, how many have decided you're, you refuse to participate in the recession? Let's hear that. Yes. Yes. Okay, there you go. That's what I like to hear. Look. Rather than me reading this, I'm going to ask Mark Helgerman to come up here and say a few words. Uh, Mark is one of my former coaching clients from the better, come on up while I'm, while I'm telling them who you are. Mark and I, what, had, had we met once before? Oh my goodness, yeah. Yeah, a decade ago, yeah. right? Uh, the rest of our relationship was all done by phone and email. He went through my coaching program, which is my flagship product. And so rather than me talking about me, although I like to do it, I'm going to allow him to do it. Why don't you step over that microphone right there, Mark? And uh, he went through my roughly six-month program, and he'll tell you what happened as a result. Well, first, we want to thank Paul and Lashbrook for bringing Jim here. I mean, Lashbrook is a cool company. Just like, I mean, we like to never say no to our customers. They're almost the same way. I mean, they have a wedding band company that's so willing to do so many special things and step out of the box and, not, and do, you know, custom orders and everything is awesome. But as far as Jim goes, I mean, uh, I did, that's been quite a few years now since I've done the coaching mm -hmm. program, but I mean, the guy has wonderful ideas and it really helps you to implement them. He puts, he puts the whole package together for you. Um, probably one of the best things I ever learned from you was in measuring everything that you do. And, you know, you I know personally I feel overwhelmed whenever I think about trying to measure a marketing campaign, but you can measure something, you know, I learned this from Jim, as small as 250, you know, piece mail or you know, where he, you know, he told, taught me how to set one up one way and just change some verbiage in one and then in another one do a little bit of different verbiage and send those out and see what responses you get because you can get a totally different response from one, you know, just one sentence can change everything and you can measure that. And the other thing is that he teaches is if you have something that is successful, you could spend any amount of money in advertising it if it actually brings people through the door because it really costs you nothing. So. And um, the other program that we had success with was with your uh, referral program. And uh, the neat thing about that is whenever we sent that out, you know, I certainly have a lot of friends and business, you know, uh, clients and everything that get, got that. I got so many compliments on it. They said, Mark, that is a great idea. And of course, I, I probably took the credit for myself. As you should, <laughs> yeah. I'm oh, yeah, okay. I came up with that. But, uh, <laughs> Jim really is a great guy and uh, has great ideas and, and uh, will help you with your business. So. Thanks. Appreciate that. Give him a hand. I have a brand new uh, CD set we'll make available to you in the back of the room in a special deal at the end. It's called Marketing Gems, How to Quickly Get More Customers Who Will Pay You More Money More Often in the Jewelry Business. And that's where I kind of start with a lot of, uh, with a lot of clients so they kind of get uh, some of the ideas that Mark talked about. So that's my credibility section. Let's get on to the meat of the matter, shall we? How would you like to give yourself a raise? Everybody who would like to do that, say yes, Jim. Yes. Okay, well, where does your raise come from? By the way, before I, before I start, let me, let me just point out uh, one or two things, and I can already tell I'm going to get a little warm. Would you mind if I take off my coat? Okay, I'm going to do that. And I am going to not only take off my coat, but I'm going to put on my whistle. Because you see, 
for the next hour, I am going to be your marketing coach. Now, what is a coach? He is both your best friend and your worst nightmare. Why is a coach your best friend? Because he helps you understand what the fundamentals are, the things you need to know to be successful. Why is he your worst nightmare? Because once he's taught you those things, he makes you do it. It's going to be difficult for me to make you do anything today, but that's the premise of the program that I try to help doulers with, is getting them into a situation. How many of you know there's things you should do in marketing, know there's things you should have been doing in marketing for a decade, and yet you haven't got them instituted in your business? Raise your hand. Just about everybody understands that, right? Well, what I bring to the table is the disciplined, regular effort to make sure that that actually happens. And that may be the biggest piece of brilliance there is, rather than any of the ideas themselves. How many owners in the room may I see by show of hands? OK, that's the majority. And the rest of you who aren't owners, raise your hand. OK, I'm going to talk to both sets of folks today. Uh, those of you who aren't owners still want to raise, I assume. And owners, you want to give yourself a raise as well. So where does the raises come from? Only one place. More money, customers. Profit. profit, that's right. You can have actually just as many people, but if you can raise the profit, you can give yourself a raise, right? So yeah, that's the only place that raises come from. You, and so you have to ask yourself, what can I do to make my company more profitable? Now I deal on all three levels, how to get more customers, how to increase your average transaction size, and how to get existing customers to come back and buy from you more often. Today, in this session, we're talking about how to close more deals, and how to increase the average transaction. In other words, we're not going to talk about advertising in this section, although the principles I share with you can spill over onto advertising, and I'll point out where those things are true. But we're going to talk about sales processes here today. And some of it you will have heard, but they'll, you'll get a different twist on. And some of it, quite frankly, might be new to you. All right. Nine essential selling secrets that guarantee you'll never worry about lousy sales again. The first is think like a customer. You know what? Uh, most of us don't in our own business. And yet the irony is we're all customers of somebody's. So we are customers. Start thinking like you were buying rather than you were selling. It'll make a difference. Establish rapport. People like to do business with people they like and so, or they feel are like them. And so establish rapport. We'll get into the details. Invoke involvement. If you can involve people in their decision-making process, you'll find that it's a lot easier to close them. Does any of that sound familiar so far? OK. Invoke, con involve contribution. If they make a contribution to you, if they, make, if they do something to help you, believe it or not, they'll be more inclined to buy. Ask empowering questions. I'm sure you've heard that in all kinds of sales training before. Sell the benefits. This is another one that you've heard before. I'm going to give you some new distinctions that you probably haven't heard before. Secure commitment. All along the way, you've probably heard that before. Here's one that blows my mind that almost nobody does, and that's predict and script. Is there anybody here, if you've been, unless you're brand new to the industry, if you've sold anything to anybody for any length of time, you realize that the same arguments come up over and over and over again. The same objectives, uh, objections come up over and over again. You ought to have the answers. And your entire sales staff ought to have the answers. But strangely, we don't. Everybody's approaching these things with different answers. Some of them work and some of them don't. But you ought to be able to figure out what works and stick with it. And we'll get into that as well. And then test, test, test for guaranteed success, which is what Mark alluded to. And the beautiful thing is, yes, you can test your advertising. You can also test and track the results you get from your sales presentations, your answering of, of objections, even frankly, what is the appropriate clothes to wear in your enterprise uh, can be tested and tracked. So we'll get into the details of that. So those are the nine essential selling secrets, and I'm going to move quickly through all of them and try to give you some real meat and potatoes that you can take home and put to use in your business right away. Let's talk, first of all, about thinking like a customer. What exactly do I mean by that? Well, who is your prospect? I mean, have you taken time to look at the profile of, of, of your average customer? Now, most of you know that your average customer comes from about a five-mile radius around your store. Okay? Um, you can also connect up demographics and, 
And um, so you'll know what, what the uh, uh, socioeconomic profile of the customer is in terms of income levels and perhaps education levels, those kinds of things. How about this question? What do they really want? We're going to get into this in a little bit greater detail, but what do they really want, not just in the jewelry they buy, but it's that old story of, you know, we, we, don't buy, we, we buy the drill because we need a hole, right? Now, what is the real motivation, in other words, behind what, uh, what they want? You know, it's the old, that's like, it wasn't it, that Mel Gibson uh, movie, What Women Want? And there was another one, I can't remember which one it was. I think it might have been when Harry met Sally or something like that. And he asked the girl, what do you people want, meaning females? And she says, we have no idea. I thought, <laughs> I know that's true with my wife. <laughs> Increased frequency of purchase. Uh, you know, believe it or not, people want to have attention paid to them. You can ask them to do business with you more often. What is the gap in their lives? What's missing? Uh, ask yourself that question about your customers. Usually they're purchasing because there's a gap. There's something, there's something missing. They're incomplete in some way. Look, nobody buys anything if they're, if they're entirely fat and happy in, in every aspect of their lives, right? So what is the gap? Ask yourself that question. What are their needs? There's a difference between wants and needs. Sometimes we, but we always, but let me say this, we always buy based on human needs. But our cognitive wants, a difference between what we think up here and what we feel down here can be an entirely different thing. And uh, what, actually what we feel down here has to do with the needs, and lots of times what we think up here has to do with the wants. And here's one that we never seem to address. Why do people resist? What do they say? Why is it they say a no when everything in their body and all the logic and everything else says, yes, I should do this, why do they say no anyway? If you can figure that out in advance, when they show you those kinds of signals, you'll know what to say and do to overcome that. And what will get them to move now? These are what I call, these last two are what I call pivotal discomfort factors. PDFs, not to be confused with the file that you get on your computer. Pivotal discomfort factors. What is making them want to move now? And to counterbalance that, what is want, making them want to stay put? where they're at. Begin to think that way. Write these things out as a customer. Now, wait a minute. Jim, I don't want to write anything out. I'm a busy dude. I got stuff to do. I don't have time to write out anything. This is all theoretical BS, and I just don't have time for it. Is that going through your head? Because here's the deal. Successful people do the things that unsuccessful people are unwilling to do. There's a price to be paid to accelerate the growth of your business beyond what you think is even possible. And this, some of this kind of stuff is where that price needs to be paid. What excuses will customer give themselves to take action? Do you realize that customers actually have to give themselves permission to buy what, do you, what you're selling them? What excuses will they give themselves to actually do that? And what excuses will they give themselves to not act? Now think about this. What have I said? I said there, is, there are these pivotal discomfort factors, highly emotional, usually unspoken, in the heart reasons that they want to take action, and also in the heart reasons why they are afraid to take action. But there's a difference between what's happening inside in the gut level compared to giving themselves excuses. Giving themselves excuses happens up here. And it's the stuff they tell themselves, it's their self-talk, you know. I really need to buy this because it'll make me cool. Or whatever it happens to be. They have excuses to give themselves. What is it safe to, to assume they know about my industry and service? Do we talk to people in jargon? Do we talk to people in ways that we assume they know stuff about our products and our services that they probably don't know? This is a real problem in this industry. Most people know very little about jewelry and gemstones. And they're very nervous about it. Are there unscrupulous jewelers? Do people sometimes get burned? 
Does it make them nervous? They don't know the intrinsic value of the things you're putting into their hands, and so, if, so they need an education. What do they most certainly not know that I must explain? There are those kinds of things. This is a little homework assignment for you to go through these processes and, like I say, write it out. What are they afraid of? And what are the competition's considerations that they might be looking at? Do you know your competition? Have you shopped your competition? Have you actually mystery shopped your competition? Sent somebody in. There are actually mystery shopping services. In fact, I would recommend that at least once a year you mystery shop your competition and at least once a year you mystery shop yourself. Send in mystery shoppers, give them a budget to actually buy stuff and see how you and your staff do when you don't know who's in front of you. That will give you the answer to many of the kinds of things that we're looking at here. And here's another one that you really have to think about. What offer might move them? Let me ask you this, ladies. When is a sale a sale? You see an ad in the, uh, in the paper or a flyer comes to the mail and it says 10% uh, off uh, dresses. Like, are you jumping in the car and hustling down to the department store for 10% off? No? So, okay, so when is a sale a sale? 30 or more. She says 30 or more. Anybody, uh, do, would, would anybody go for less than that? 25. 20, if she's a 25% girl, like that, okay. Anybody under that? What's that? Buy one, get one free. She's a, she's a BOGO girl, okay? <laughs> and yet, how about this? How many times do you make an offer that says 10% off? And then, you, then it doesn't work. You send that out via direct mail or you put an ad out there or you, it's something that's on your floor and it doesn't seem to move anybody and you go, advertising doesn't work. My sales staff, what's the matter with my sales staff? They can't make a deal. Well, that, that offer, you see what I mean by thinking like a customer? If you make an offer like that, that isn't compelling, and I'm not even saying you have to make any discounts at all. We might get into offers if we have a little bit of time. My point is, you got to think like a customer. If you believe 35% off is where a deal starts, then some either discount or value add, this is to attract new customers, in that range is where you need to be. The customer is not an idiot, they're people just like you. All right? So, that's what I mean. Offers are huge. All right, now let's go into these this process of establishing rapport. Anybody heard that before? What does that mean to establish rapport? Credibility. Ability to communicate. Build a, relationship. build a relationship. That's really what it begins, that's really where it kind of starts. You begin to build a relationship. And there's a variety of ways people tell you to do this. You know, the sales trainer says, if you're doing outside sales, or even if you're doing inside sales, come somebody comes in and they've got a particular piece of jewelry on that you find it make some comment about the jewelry is what they'll tell you right or if you go if you're doing outside sales you walk into a prospects office look around at the accoutrements and the the things that they've got on the walls and those kinds of things and may, you know oh I see you got a fish on the wall do you like the fish yeah fishing's great it's kinda of contrived isn't it the fact of the matter is it's not a bad attempt but what if no, I hate fishing. I have that on the wall because my son, uh, my son got it and I uh, feel like I have to have it there or something like that. Then all the rapport you're trying to establish goes right down the drain. There's easier ways to do that. <laughs> what about smile and be friendly? Now, that seems obvious, doesn't it? Guess what? It is kind of obvious, but there are rare occasions where that might be exactly the wrong disposition to have. You know, I was talking to uh, Cindy earlier this morning when we came in and she said, seems like everybody I've talked to since I got the ride over in the cab was, has been grumpy. She, she was happy to see me because I wasn't grumpy. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, uh, if, if somebody comes in and they've really got a sour disposition and you're going, how does that go over? Right? Okay, so you've got to do something a little bit to reflect the kind of mood that they're in, and that's what I talk about when I talk about matching and mirroring. Yes, you should generally be warm and friendly, but take a look at the way they are behaving and start out there, all right? 
You can mirror their facial expressions. Within reason, I guess. <laughs> you know? Okay, what about their body language? You know, I watched a friend of mine do this so masterfully one time. He happened to be a printer. Some lady came in, and, and when she, this lady was always dour, every time she came in, the staff would scatter. Okay, that's how, you know, that kind of person, right? I could tell you could relate. Okay, so one day, she walks in, and everybody scatters, and this guy happened to be the owner of the place, and she's leaning on the counter like this. And he walks up and just says very flatly, leans on the counter just like her, how you doing? And she said something, I can't remember what it was, but it was dour. And he starts reflecting both her body language and her communication patterns and tonality. Whoops, went too far there. And anyway, he, he started acting basically just like her. And after a couple of minutes of conversation where he's just kind of all this way, he begins to straighten up a little bit. And he begins to warm up. And he matched and mirrored her first, and then he led her out of that. And suddenly she was in a much better mood, warmer, more friendly. And guess what? The whole transaction went by in a much more smooth and more favorable outcome than ever before. And people stood around and go, how did you do that? Well, that's how he did it. It's as simple as that. And again, if you think like a customer, if you have empathy, if you feel like, uh, try, try to match their, their physiology, their facial expressions, the way they talk. You know, if they say cool a lot, you say cool a lot. You know, you know if they use some other phraseology that's uh, unique to them or, or to your part of the country, Use that a lot. Now, wait a minute, Jim, that's so, so manipulative, so... No, it isn't. The idea is to get to common ground, okay? And then you can move forward, and everybody wins, all right? It is not manipulative. It is, in fact, just the opposite of that. It is, it is courteous and considerate to meet people on their terms rather than yours. Does that make sense? If it does, say yes, Jim. Yes. Okay? Now, look. There is a difference between knowledge and skill. I've just given you a piece of knowledge. There's only one way to cultivate the skill, and that is practice. You've got to work at this. If it's not your natural way to do things, and it isn't mine, okay? If it's not your natural way to do things, it's very important that you practice this skill, and that's what tr sales trainings are for, folks. That's why you should have a sales training at least weekly in your business. If you're having your sales training owners less than weekly, you're not having them often enough, all right? Find commonality. Got kids? <laughs> I happen to have nine. I'm common with nobody. <laughs> okay, yeah, find commonality. Once you've done the matching and mirroring, then if you can find some things that you've got some commonality on, that's a good thing to do. And then remember your manners, as simple as that. You know, be polite. Uh, be respectful, be considerate of folks, those things will all go a long way toward establishing rapport. Does that make sense? All right. More building blocks. Invoke involvement and in involve contribution. All right. Ask involvement questions. Who knows what an involvement question is? Anybody share, care to share that? Okay. An involvement question is a question that will allow the person to see themselves in ownership of the product, okay? So if, if somebody comes in, the natural thing to say to somebody is, um, may I help you today? How many of you say something like that? May I help you today? Anybody say that? No. Only, two, only two people? That's, that's actually good. Already okay. <laughs> you already learned that. Somebody's already, so what do you say instead? What's the occasion is a good one. Are you looking for something special not quite as good? Uh, are you shopping for yourself today? Or are you looking for a gift for someone else? That's a very rudimentary, um, yeah, that's, that's an involvement question. That's, that's, that involves them immediately, but it's not involving them in the process of ownership necessarily. Okay? So I like something like, what's the occasion? 
or are you buying for yourself today or someone else, those things, uh, uh, again, um, that involves them in the ownership process a little bit. Going to a more sophisticated level of an involvement question might be something like, um, uh, do you have, you know, what kind of out outfits or, you know, ladies, I, you know, do you have matching shoes for that? <laughs> you know, something, you know, they, they need to, in, if they can envision themselves actually wearing it, again, the, the idea of what's the occasion is, a, you know, if you come in and you say, are you buying for yourself or someone else today? That's the first involvement question. That leaves the other one on the table. Once they let you know that, then you can say, is there a special occasion you're looking to wear this for? Now they're involved at a second level. Then you say to them something along the lines of, What'll be, what'll you be, what do you envision wearing for that occasion or something? Now they're really involved. They're already future, you're future pacing them. You're letting them know what is out there, what the possibilities are. What I, what's what I call selling the dream. Okay? That's the kind of thing I'm talking about with involvement questions. Avoid say no questions. What is a say no question? Anybody know? If there, can I help you? Yeah, that's a say no question. That's exactly right. And in fact, avoid yes no questions because they're say no questions, generally speaking. Now, there is a, there's an exception to the rule. If you want them to, if, if, you, if, you're use, if you're doing a qualifying question, then that might make some sense, you know. So uh, a qualifying question may have to do with uh, affordability. It may have to do with uh, timing. There's any number of things that it might be. If you're trying to limit them in some way, then you go ahead and ask that kind of question or put them into a category. Seek opinions, all right? Ask them their opinions and that goes to the contribution side of things as well, by the way. When you ask somebody's opinion, if you said something like, I wonder if you could help me with something, okay? We've just put in this new showcase over here. Could you tell me what you think? Or what do you think of these you know, we're thinking about adding this line or, you know, any number of things that you could sue. As soon as you've asked them to, if, as soon as you've sought their opinion, believe it or not, you've actually given them a gift. What is the gift that you give people when you seek their opinion? Value. It's involvement. Value. value. In other words, you're demonstrating that you value them. Does it make them feel important? Is that important to people to feel important? You acknowledge them, you pay attention to them, and now that rapport is strengthened because you've demonstrated that you value them, all right? Seek opinions. S uh, seek projected outcomes. That's kind of like we were talking about before, about, uh, you know, what, do you, what will you be wearing with that? So that kind of thing is a projected outcome. And ask people for help or a contribution like we've kind of given an example of, okay? Even, you know, something like, as you're, as you're pulling out a display or something like, would you hold this for, could you hold this for me for a second? Something as simple as that, believe it or not, make, they're now giving, making a contribution. And they're, when they're making a contribution, they feel more emotionally tied to the transaction. Okay? Simple little stuff that would be really easy to engineer into your business and helps people feel more comfortable, helps them like you more, People like to do business with people they like. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Ask empowering questions. Now, this doesn't always come into play. It isn't always necessary. If you're selling some low-end stuff that's virtually an impulse buy, you're not going to need to do this. But as you think toward bridal sets and, and large stones and things that are multi-thousand dollar sales, these kinds of things come into play. It's called spin selling. You know what spin selling is? Anybody read that book by Neil Rackham, Spin Selling? I know you have, Paul. Good, okay, a couple of you have, so this will be familiar to you. What is spin selling? It stands for, it's an acronym, Situation, Problem, Implication, and <laughs> it should say problem resolution <laughs> down there. I thought I caught all those things. Yeah, so situation, uh, pro problem, implication, say, it should say uh, needs resolution, isn't it? What is, needs resolution, right? Yeah, gosh dang. All right, so what is your situation? The, we spend too much time asking these kinds of situations, you know, things like, uh, you know, what's your budget, what's the occasion, that kind of thing, uh, should be fairly quick, upfront, get a quick assessment of what's going on, and then get into the problem stage of things. You know, what, 
what's the, what's the challenge that you're facing here? And it could be anything, for, they could have budgetary concerns, uh, they could be, you know, they could, in, in, uh, they could imply that they're kind of in the doghouse with their spouse and they need to get out. Uh, it's, uh, the problem is, it's late, uh, you know, I missed, I missed last year's anniversary and I've got one day to solve this problem for this year's anniversary or I'm in real trouble, whatever it happens to be, they might have some big event that their, uh, that their husband's, uh, you know, for their husband's work that they got to really bling up for. Whatever it happens to be, find out what the problem is, okay? Now it's important to deepen their pain. Whatever their pain is, you've got to deepen it. So that's where you go to the implication side. Well, gee whiz, you know, if you don't look good for that party, how's that going to reflect on your husband's job situation? Now, look, you, you, you kind of chuckle, and, and that, that doesn't come up in every situation, and it's certainly not going to come up very often in, for example, a small town or something like that. But I'll tell you what, if, you're, if you live in Chicago, and you work for a big firm, an ad agency, or, or uh, you know, a big investment house, or something like that, where the social aspect of things is important for upward mobility, these things can have meaningful implications. And you need to remind people of that. You know, it might be something as simple as, my mother-in-law thinks I'm a loser. You know, I mean, is, is that a problem for people? I've, I've, I told you, I've got nine kids, right? Seven of them are married. So that means I've got seven in-law kids. I'm pretty lucky I like them all. <laughs> Does my wife like them all? Yeah, she pretty well does. But we don't, we're easy to get along with. So that's what the implication question. You drill down. Drill down and, and get them to tell you, gee whiz, if I don't solve this problem, it causes even bigger problems. Okay? So that's what you get to. And then needs resolution is, if we solve this problem for you, what are the implications of solving the problem? Gee whiz. If we can make you the bell of the ball, would that make, first of all, would that make you happy? Yeah. How, how, how will your husband feel about that? Oh, he'll be thrilled. Okay, that's a needs resolution question. And you notice how those are all, anything from here on down, really, I should use this, right, because I got one in there. Any from problems on down, those things are all involvement questions. All right, so I'd recommend the book, Spin Selling by Neil Rackham. I don't have time to go into more detail about these things, but these are important considerations. Okay, how many have heard this before, sell the benefits? Raise your hand if you've ever had any tra sales training where it talks about sell the benefits. What do they mean by that? What's that? Okay, at the end of the day, that's what it's about. Tell me, you, you've heard the, the argument, if, if, not a, what, if people don't sell the benefits, what are they usually selling? Features, that's exactly right. So what is a feature? Yeah, it's a characteristic of the product. Anything, a feature is a characteristic of the product. Anything that's attached to the product, right? If it's, um, the car is red, okay? The car's always going to be red. It's attached to the car. The car could sit on a uh, showroom floor for 40 years. It'd still be red might be faded red by then, but it's still going to be red, right? Okay, so that's a feature. It's connected to the product. If it's connected to the product, you're always going to be talking about a feature. All right, what's a benefit? The positive result, right, that the customer experiences from using the product. Okay, what, gentlemen, is the positive result of driving a red car? Chick magnet. Chick magnet. Who said that? Okay, keen sense of the obvious, all right? <laughs> he points to his wife and says, hey, I drove a red car, look what I got. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> all right, yeah, it's the positive result. And again, it goes to that idea of people don't buy a drill, they're buying the hole, right? It's the result that they want after the fact. So we've got to talk to people in benefit language, okay? How many have heard this phrase? Sell the sizzle, not the steak. That's not right. Sizzle is a feature. It's connected to the steak. Okay? What is it that we're wanting? We're wanting a, a, a sublime gustatory experience. 
That's what we're looking for. So those are the, that's the kind of language you talk in, okay? You always talk about the benefits first because that's what people really want. We're all tuned to the same radio station. What does it mean, WIIFM? What's in it for me? That's exactly right. We're all tuned to that station. That's the only thing we care about. They don't care about how long you've been in business. They don't care how many certifications that you've got. They don't care what your logo looks like. That's not that you don't use those things, but until they know what's in it for them, they don't care about any of that stuff. And yet, what do we put at the top of our ads? Our logo. Our logo. Right at the one place we've got a chance to give them a benefit and we give them a feature. Okay? So, we buy in our hearts, we buy in our guts, we already talked about that. We buy to fulfill the following human needs, the need for survival. Do people buy jewelry for survival purposes? Not really. I mean, really, the kind of survival we're talking about is, you know, uh, uh, food, shelter, clothing, a job, and transportation. We don't buy jewelry for that. Um, uh, that's not it. Love and be loved, is that why we buy jewelry? Yeah. How big a motivator is that in people's lives? I got nine kids. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, it's a big How about the need to feel important? We talked about that. You know, we all go around in life with an invisible sign hung around our neck. And everybody's sign says exactly the same thing. Make me feel important. If you will make your customers feel important, they will love you and they will buy from you. The need for variety. Is that a motivator in the world of jewelry? Absolutely. You know, unless your name is... Johnny Cash or Batman, I suspect when we open your closet, we see a whole variety of different things. We have a human need for that, okay? And how about this one, the Lay's factor, the need for convenience. This is unique to Western society, but I believe it is, in fact, a human need. The frenetic pace of our world is so crazy, anything you can do to simplify people's lives will be compelling to them, all right? So you think about those kinds of things and you engineer your sales presentations to address those kinds of issues. Does that make sense? All right. The language you use, which I'm going to talk to you about. Okay. There are two, two uh, there are three kinds of features. Physical characteristics of our products, okay, or our store, or whatever it happens to be, those are features. There are credibility characteristics and there are delivery characteristics. Physical characteristics, pretty straightforward. What's a credibility characteristic? How long you've been in business. Now, I just, didn't I just get done saying nobody cares about that? And yet, they do care on the level of once, once they've figured out that you can possibly help them solve the problem, they need the confidence to move forward and go ahead. So there is a place for, to talk about features once you've delivered benefits. So yeah, how long you've been in business, what your certifications are, how many gemologists you have, whatever it happens to be, those kinds of things bring credibility. What about testimonials from customers? Is that a credibility characteristic? Yeah. Absolutely. How many of you use them? Look around the room. A handful of uh, hands went up only. Testimonials, gang, are huge. What do you think I had Mark come up for? Okay. It's very important, but most jewelers and most, most retailers, in fact, most businesses, never take full advantage of those kinds of things. There's two kinds of benefits. The first is what I call primary benefits. These are the true emotional needs that we have. Anything that, that directs people to that need to love and be loved, the need to feel important, variety or convenience, those are primary benefits. And the interesting thing about them is they are the main emotional drivers, but they go directly to the core emotional human needs. And the problem with that is they're often subconscious and not immediately considered by either the marketer or the prospect. Think about this for a minute. You know, um, uh, do, does somebody really say to themselves, I'm going to buy that red car because it's a chick magnet? They probably give themselves a whole lot of cognitive reasons to do it. But at the, at the core is that idea of, hey, I'm going to be more attractive to the ladies. You know, they may or may not think that, all right? When people buy your products, what is the difference between what's going on down here and what's going on up here, you know? 
I'll give you a quick example. I, I operate on Macintosh computers and have since 1986. I had, and, and I'm in the advertising business. So I had a friend of mine, a guy who I admired, who was, uh, had a bigger agency than mine, a little bit further along, and he bought many years ago uh, an Apple PowerBook with a little trackball on it in the old days, right? And, and he bought the PowerBook 2 or something like that. I went out and bought the PowerBook 3, okay? Now, why did I do that? To be cool. And, and as you can see, it worked. But do I go home to the mother of nine and say, honey, I just blew an extra thousand bucks so I could be cool? No, I go home to the mother of nine and say, honey, check out this computer. It's got an ergonomically designed keyboard, so I'll never have to worry about getting carpal tunnel syndrome. It's got this nifty trackball, so I'll never have to worry about losing my mouse. And you see, what I'm doing is justifying in my head what I wanted to do in my heart. The challenge in primary benefits is for you to anticipate what they are and talk to your customers in language that resonates to the core of their very soul. If the guy's motivation is his mother-in-law thinks he's a loser, and you say, when your mother-in-law sees the ring that you put on her finger, she is going to be blown away. Now that sounds cheesy in a crowd like this, but one-on-one -on -one in front of a customer, that guy's going, yeah. Right? So that's the trick you've got. I mean, that takes a little bit of forethought. If, if you'll notice, everything I'm talking about this morning takes a little bit of forethought. Secondary benefits are the cognitive drivers. Those are the things we think about up in our head, and you still got to talk about those. They're first recognized tangible results, all right? And they're not inherently emotional. So you use those. You use them in your advertising. You also use them in your face-to-face -face sales presentations. All right, now, I'm going to simplify that process for you by telling you how to talk to people in benefit language. Here's what, most people don't talk benefits at all. They only talk features. The typical construct for those who do talk about features and benefits both is features so that benefit. All right? Um, why, do you do, why do you do rhodium uh, plating on the, uh, uh, rhodium treatment on a ring? to keep it white, right? So a, a, a typical construct would be this ring is rhodium plated, is that the right term? Rhodium plated feature so that you'll always have a sparkling white ring. All right, that's the benefit. You will always have a sparkling white ring, okay? That is a feature benefit, feature slash benefit statement and is less powerful than Benefit because feature. You will always have a beautiful, sparkling, white ring because it's rhodium plated. Does that make sense? Can you see the difference? Now, what is it that they want? They want that sparkling white ring. That's why you lead with it. And then you justify the promise with the, with the feature. And that's the way you stay in benefit language. You want me to make it even simpler than that? No? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Make sure you speak to people from the point of you. The point of you. What do I mean by that? Begin your sentences with either the word you or any verb, almost any verb. Grow, learn, earn, experience, enjoy, uh, those kinds of things. Any action word is a verb. If you start a sentence with an action word, you will always be in benefit language because if you'll remember from fifth grade English, Mrs. Hummer taught me, that makes it an imperative sentence where the subject of the sentence is implied to be you. Aren't you glad you came? <laughs> okay, yeah, just start out with either the word you or a verb and you'll always be in benefit language. Simple as that, okay? Could I make it any easier than that? Okay, good. All right, let's move forward with a blank screen. Secure commitment, that's the next one. Uh, upfront contracts, anybody heard of this concept before? Securing an upfront contract? Okay, get right up front when people get in the door, 
get a commitment from them about what they're trying to accomplish in ch coming there today. Okay? You know, do they want to buy? Are they just shopping? What is going, what are you both going to agree is a successful conclusion to today's transaction, whether it's, whether it's buy or not? Okay? Uh, and it's, it's, it's legitimate that they don't necessarily have to commit to buy in every case. And, and, and if, you, if you commit to, I'm going to spend 15 minutes with you educating you about uh, the four C's so that as you move forward, not only in this transaction but in your life, you, f you have a better understanding of, of uh, how jewelry is valued and those kinds of things. When you get to the end of that explanation, that doesn't mean you can't move forward to something else, but you want to confirm the fact that, have I delivered on that promise? So that they understand you made a commitment to them and you lived up to it, and therefore you expect them to live up to whatever commitments they made to you. Okay? That's the idea behind an upfront uh, contract. The agreement frame. Does anybody know what the agreement frame is? Okay? You get people sometimes will disagree with you on something. There's no point ever in arguing with the customer. You can never win that. All right? So I would say don't try. What you try to do is get with the agreement frame. And the agreement frame basically says, I understand how you feel. I felt that way myself. And what I have found is, or and what our customers have found is. All right? Eliminate the word but from your vocabulary. That is anything but an agreement frame. As soon as you say but, you disqualify how they felt and they feel. When you say and, you open up the possibility that gives them, they can look at other alternatives, okay? So the three elements of the agreement frame, once again, are I understand how you feel, I have felt that way myself, and what we have found is. All right? That's a little script that you can use. That's the agreement frame. You'll keep people in an agreement mode if you use that kind of thing. Tie downs and trust. Yes? One more time? Yeah. The first one is, I understand how you feel. I felt that way myself. And you may embellish that a little bit, you know. And then the third one is, and what we have found is, or what I have found is, or what our customers have found is. Okay? All right? Tie downs and trial closes. You've heard of those before. What are they? It's a question that asks for, basically a question that asks for some level of commitment, you know. Is that what you're looking for? Is a trial, is, is a tie down? When they say yes, you've moved the needle. Okay? You might want to ask several tri uh, tie down type things. Would that make you happy? Is that what you're looking for? Uh, this would do that for you, wouldn't it? Those kinds of things uh, where you make a statement with some kind of a thing like wouldn't it at the end or isn't it? Those are tie downs. Okay? Trial closes have to do, again, it's kind of an involvement question of, you know, um, you know, do you need to take delivery on this right away or would next week be okay? They say I need to take delivery on it right away, you know it's time to close, right? That's a trial close. Assumptive close, what's the assumptive close? Yeah, you just assume they're going to buy and say, you know, let me get out the paperwork and we'll write this up or let me get the, you know, we've got a wonderful, um, you know, one of our, our, our custom uh, our custom cherry wood boxes, I'd, I'll put that in, let me go grab it for you. That's an assumptive close. Okay? I wish I had time to go into details on all these things for you, but we don't. But here's one that's really interesting one. It's, uh, you can't use it everywhere, but it's the core value close. And if people are wavering, you know, they know that they should make this purchase, they're just wavering, they're afraid to make the commitment, you ask them something like, well, what's important to you about this? And they, they tell you, and then you say, well, what's important to you about that? And whatever they tell you, you say once again, well, what's important to you about that? You're trying to drill down to that emotional level. And when you get to that emotional level, and you, and they, and you say to them, what's, what, what's to you is important about that? And they get to that point where you can either see that little tear come to their eye or the tickle show up in their belly, then you just say, that's what this will do for you and be quiet and let them stew and that's what they'll do 
And you know, I've seen close rates as high as 90% using this kind of a close. It's not, you, you don't use it all the time. It's just in that situation where people are teetering. All right, does that make sense? Again, I'm talking about skills here. These things, I, I, I'm kind of giving you a fire hose worth of, of no, knowledge. You're gonna have to practice it. That's what your meetings are for. And this again is really, you know, people bomb because they hear the same arguments over and over again, the same objections over and over again, and yet, for some reason, every time it comes up, either you or your sales staff don't know how to say things. How often do you get hit with a bomb? How often does somebody come in and say something you've never heard before? Come up with a challenge of, or an objection to, your, to what you're doing that you've never heard before. You can predict all the questions. If you've been in this business for anywhere from three months to a year, you've probably heard almost all of the things that could possibly come up. So in sales meetings, start off in your next sales meeting, let's make a list of all the objections we hear. And maybe that's all you do for one sales meeting. And then you go back, whether you go back to your office or you send the team back to all come up with what are your answers to each of those things or whatever you do, a little bit of homework, but have them write out the answers. That when somebody says this, this is what I say. And you script it, but Jim, nobody wants to use scripts. We all have our own personalities, blah, blah. Guess what? Scripts work. I once added four and a half million dollars to a company's inbound telemarketing crew by just teaching them how to use scripts. If you're not using scripts to upsell and add on sell, you are leaving tens of thousands of dollars on the table. I have a client in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia area, uh, uh, Mark's Jewelers, do you know him? Jim Brusilovsky. Uh, we figured out, we made one little offer on his Pandora line. One little add-on offer on his Pandora line, and he got like a 10% take rate on it. For a, an add-on, he was saying, okay, you know, if you buy two Pandora beads, I'll give you $25 off on these set of, this set of earrings. If you buy three beads, I'll give you $50 off. He had about 10% of the people he offered that do, that to took it. But he's a big Pandora dealer. He does 8,000 Pandora tra transactions a year. He figured on a profit-only basis, if he did that single offer to every single one of his Pandora customers, the, the uh, transactions, and only one in 10 said yes, he would add $41,250 in profits in one year by having a little script. Why wouldn't you do that? Okay, you want me to give you a script for add-on selling right now? Okay, write this down, this is good. It is, it's, it, this is gold. works everywhere it goes. Because you've made this purchase today, Mrs. Jones, now look, you don't say Mrs. Jones as if it's Mrs. Mrs. Smith, right, you got that? Because you've made this purchase today, Mrs. Jones, you have qualified for a special offer on fill in the blank. Let me say that one more time. Because you have made this purchase today, Mrs. Jones, you have qualified for a special offer on whatever it is your special offer is, okay? Simple little script. Have all your salespeople use it, okay? All right. You can predict all the questions. You can predict all the answers. You can predict all the objections. Why wouldn't you figure out what those answers are in advance, train your staff on what to say when somebody says X, you say Y, and that alone will drive your, your closing rates up a phenomenal amount. And then test, test, test for guaranteed success. Start with a script, consider a second version of the script. I gave you a script, but there may be a second version of the script. Here's another little script that you could use for add-on selling. Before you go, Mrs. Jones, I got three really cool things I want to show you. May I? Now that's a say no question, but remember, in this situation, it's an add-on sell, right? So you don't want to be a pushy person when it comes to the add-ons, so you get permission. Well, I got three really cool, or I got three really hot items, in fact, that you could test. You could test, I've got three really cool items I'd like to show you, Mrs. Jones, may I? Or I've got three really hot items I'd like to show you, Mrs. Jones, may I? And test which one gets more yeses. Take her over and she, you've now pre-programmed her to look at three additional items. The secret to getting the max out of those three additional items is show her the first one, ask for a decision. 
Show, regardless of what she says on the first one, show her the second one, ask for a decision. Regardless of what she says on the second one, show her the third one and ask for a decision. Now you're looking at me and going, I'd never do that, Jim, because that's too pushy. Pushiness is a function of execution, not what you, it's not a what you do thing, it's a how you do thing, okay? And if you script it properly and elegantly, there will never be any sense whatsoever of being pushy. In fact, the feeling that they will get is, wow, these guys are serving me on the highest possible level. I like the way they take care of me. Now, I don't have time to go into the idea of how you write that aspect of things, but as Mark will tell you, there's a way to do it. And you can, there is a way to elegantly execute in such a way that people will thank you for doing these kinds of things, okay? So you take this two versions and you have your sales staff, everybody with each customer do every other one. You know, first customer comes in, try script A. Second one, script B. Third one, script A. Next one, script B. Keep track of the results and within three days to a week, you'll know which script is more effective, okay? Try them both, every other one, refine and test again. Keep the process going. Test your attire. I wasn't happy with my attire yesterday. I wore something nicer today. Test other elements of your pitch. And let's see, let me back up to that again before I go. How much time do I have, by the way? I have 15 minutes? I do? Well, that's great. I was worried. I'm going like crazy, believe me. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> so those are, those are the elements so far. Now those are the things that I, the, the nine things that I talked about, okay? That really takes you through the nine essential selling secrets. I put this stuff in for a bonus if you're interested. Referral selling. How many people would like to get a bigger percentage? Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> you win the prize first hand up. That's very good. <laughs> yeah, uh, wouldn't you like to have a bigger percentage of your business? Why? What's good about referrals? There's almost no cost of acquisition. Have, you, have any of you ever calculated what it costs you to bring a new customer in the door through advertising in the traditional sense of the word? Have you ever actually sat down and said, what does it cost on an average per customer? I mean, you know, okay, I'm spending 5% of my gross revenue on advertising. Okay, you, you got that. So if you're a million dollar store, you're spending 50 grand or whatever it is. Is that, is that the right number? Somebody do the math. Okay, if you're spending 5% on a million dollar store, it's 50 grand? Yeah, yeah I think so. Um, I'm a marketing guy, not a bean counter. So the, the point of the matter is, if you know you're spending 50 grand, you see that in your head as, boy, that's a $50,000 expenditure. I don't look at it that way. I look at it as, what is it costing me to buy a single customer? So here's what you do. You've all got some point of sale software that tells you when a new customer comes in the door. What you do is say, okay, and I'm talking about new customers now, right? I'm spending $50,000. I got 1,000 new customers this year. What was my cost per customer? Anybody do the math? It's, it's, somebody's got to be good at math in here. Huh? It's 100 bucks a customer, isn't it? $50 a customer. By the way, if you get customers, if you're buying customers for 50 bucks a piece or less, you're doing extremely what? Well, what, what's your number? Um, I don't have a list, but it's a lot higher. It's a lot higher than that, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the really good stores that I've worked with are looking at anywhere from about $100 to $150 to acquire a first-time customer. That's what it costs. Have you ever thought, have you ever thought that through? Boy, you'd have a lot more respect for your advertising budget if you knew what that number was. But it's also good news because you know what marketing is? Marketing is buying customers. That's all it is. The idea is you buy them for less than what they bring you over time. So stop looking at the transactional value of a customer and start looking at the lifetime profit value of a customer instead. Two kinds of referral systems, passive referrals. These give incentives to your customers for referring their friends. If your friends, if, if you will refer your friends to us, Mrs. Jones, we will give you some kind of incentive. Now what's the natural incentive to give them? M well, money's not bad. Money will work. Gift cards, in-store credit kinds of things is a good one, but there are others. What, what about dinner for two in a movie? You know, something like that, okay? Which one are you using, Mark? What are you, 
you said you use the referral program. Which, which do you use? The, we give percentage you, you, Okay, all right, good. Okay, uh, resulting referrals are usually a lie down sale, right? People come in on referral, they're gonna buy. You, uh, the, the problem uh, here is that you don't get control of the names in advance, so you have to wait for the, on a passive system, what you're doing is you're saying to your customers, send in your friends, we will reward you when you do, and then you have to sit and wait for the friends to come in, okay? Now when they come in, they're already primed to buy, so that's the good part about it. Proactive referrals is when you give your incentives to customers for referring their friends. The resulting referrals may take some additional relationship building because what you're doing is actually getting your customers to give you names so that you can proactively go out and start marketing to those folks and have a system in place that says so-and-so suggested you might appreciate the kind of services and products we provide. We'd like to invite you to become one of our clients. This is what it takes and uh, the language and all we can get to some other time. Uh, but that is an important thing. Now here's seven keys to have a successful referral system. The challenge and the reason why you don't get more referrals is it's not systematic. You're working on an incidental plane. All right, now what we want to do is systemize something so that it happens on autopilot all the time. And in fact, you can predict every month X percentage of my business I expect is going to come from referrals. Incentives for your referrals. So you're giving incentives to the referring customer and then you give an incentive to the referral to come in and induce trial. Try to get them in the first time. Make it something good. Don't be 10% offers. Give them $50 to spend just like cash or $100 to spend just like cash, depending on the profile of your inventory. My friend Wink Jones, with whom I did the first set of CDs, would give people $100 just like cash. Come on and spend it just like cash. Didn't have anything in his store less than $300. Okay, But when somebody gets a $100 gift, that's meaningful. That feels good. That feels, that's worth me taking my time to go check these guys out. So make it a meaningful offer. Look, if you do regular advertising and you're paying 100 or 150 bucks to get them in the front door anyway, why would you not give them $100 to spend just like cash? If they come in and, give, and take $100 out and never buy anything, it costs you somewhere between 35 and 50 bucks out of pocket. But if they do come in and buy something, even if they just come in and buy the hundred bucks, you now have a new customer and, the, and you paid far less than the hundred or 150 you were paying before. It's a no brainer, but the offer has got to be compelling. Incentives for your salespeople and staff. Anytime you ask your staff to do something new, I understand that they're being paid, but you got to change, you're asking them to change. You're just asking them to do something different than they had before. Give them some kind of a spiff or some kind of reward. It could be anything from candy bars to a free lunch to cash spiffs, whatever it happens to be, to execute the system. Make sure they're telling people about your referral program. You'll need scripts for them. If you go to your staff and you say, guys, we need to start asking for referrals. Here's some gift certificates to have your customers hand out. And that's all you do, you won't get a high level of compliance. All right, so you've got to instruct them, this is the system, this is exactly the way we want it executed. By the way, in training people, you also deliver the message to them that this is important to me. If you just tell them to do it, they'll think, oh, Bob's got a bug up his butt again, we guess we've got to humor him for a couple of days. Okay? If you train them and train them consistently, the message comes across, hey, Bob's really serious about this, I guess we better do it. I love you because you're shaking your head. I like that. I appreciate that. <laughs> Training for your salespeople and staff. Okay, we already alluded to that. If you train them consistently, that's part of the system. And then a tracking system. You need two kinds of tracking in the world of referrals. You need to track the number of referrals you're getting, and you need to track what. Uh, uh, um, uh, you need to obviously track who gets the rewards. Okay, so you got to track those two things. Does that make sense? Okay. Any questions on any of this so far? Oh, tracking system, make sure the process is working, yeah. Okay, that's the two systems. Okay, so what did we talk about? Think like a customer, establish rapport, invoke involvement, involve contribution, ask empowering questions, sell the benefits, secure commitment, and predict and script. Those are the nine essential, oh, and I think testing after that, yeah. Okay, 
So those are the nine. It, did you get anything new today? Okay, anything you're going to take back to your office and use starting tomorrow? Okay, uh, look, I, I hope that's true, but let me warn you, okay? Here's what normally happens. You come to an event like this, you just burn three or four days of your life. I don't mean burn because it was a terrific event. Well, it was good for me. I hope it was good for you. All right. Uh, but you just spent four days away from the business. Okay. Three if you figure Sunday was a day off. You're going to go back and there's going to be staff people there who are going to be in your face. We got to do this. We got to do that. There's a lot of urgencies that come into play. Isn't that right? If it is, say yes, Jim. Yes. What normally happens is people go back to their office. They let their urgencies get in the way of their priorities and the stuff never gets implemented. In fact, the implementation rate among people who come to workshops and seminars is somewhere between 1.4 and 8.4 percent. Okay? I've done that research myself. 1.4 to 8.4 percent. Don't be that person. Here's what I recommend you do. Go back to your office, walk in the door, say to your staff, unless the building is burning down, you are not to disturb me for the next hour and start to implement something of what you heard here today in that first hour of time. From that point forward, I would recommend that you commit a minimum of 30 minutes a day to building and refining the marketing systems of your business in all three areas of business growth. Bringing in new customers, getting, exist, getting an increase in your average transaction size, and getting existing customers to come back and buy from you more often. 30 minutes a day. It's as important to stop as it is to start. So you go in and you tell your staff for the next 30 minutes, minimum, you can choose an hour if you want, for the next 30 minutes, do not disturb me unless the building is burning down. Well, what if we get a really important customer come in the door for the next 30 minutes? Okay, well, what if a computer crashes? If the building is burning down, get me out. Otherwise, leave me alone with the, you know, the, uh, the other exception is if my spouse calls and my kid's been in an accident or something like that, obviously. But anything short of some real disaster, don't allow urgencies to impact upon your priorities. You start doing this, folks. Even if you don't take any of my advice, if you spend just 30 minutes a day working on building the marketing systems of your business, you will be amazed at what good things happen in that business. Your assignments. Examine each of the steps in your own selling process, adjust them in consideration of the nine selling secrets. Create a list of features and benefits for your product, service, or company, and craft marketing statements in benefit language. Develop a script you will use in asking for referrals and determine several elements of your sales process to be tested, should say, then test each one individually. Those are your marching orders. If any of you would like me to check on you, <laughs> That's what a good coach does. I will need your business card, all right? Now, a couple of things. In the back of the room, you'll see information about my coaching program. It is not for everybody. Uh, you have to be willing to work your sorry little tail off for about a six month period of time, am I right? It was an hour a day, right? Okay, it was worth it? Okay. Um, I have six certificates back there if you're not committing to anything, that's a, that's, that program starts at $7,800. If you think you might be interested in it, I have six certificates back there that are signed by me that, just, that are for $600 off on that. All you're committing to is having me call you and talk to you on the phone about it sometime in the next two weeks. You're not committing to buy anything, okay? Do not do, don't, and there's brochures about the coaching program back there as well. Please don't take a brochure if you are a, an employee. And I know the boss sent you there here and he might want, but there's only a very limited number of brochures available back there. So if you're an owner and you might be interested in the coaching program, check out the brochure. And if you're really interested in having a conversation, fill out that little form. You keep the yellow copy, I keep the white copy, okay? What is available for everybody in this room and that I highly recommend for everybody in this room is this 12 CD set. 
okay? I don't want to take a bunch of these home. So this is normally a $197 value. It is fully guaranteed for life. That's how confident I am in the information on this. If you ever, and I have had one returned in, in uh, over a decade, but uh, I'm, I'm so confident that you'll like what you get on this CD set that if you go ahead and buy it, I'll, and, and you decide 150 years from now it wasn't worth the investment, send it back and I'll give you, I won't be around in 150 years, okay? I think I got, I think I got somewhere between 20 to 30 years left, okay? So, you know, realistically. So you got 30 year guarantee on the thing. If any time in that time you decide, hey, this was a bad investment, feel free to send it back. However, I don't want to take them home. Normally 197 bucks. Today only 97 bucks. Okay, so if anybody wants it. Now, if you already bought a set at one of my other sessions, I will rebate the difference because I gave one session I gave them at 167 and 177. So if you want them, if you, I'll give you a rebate on that, but anybody, please, this is well worth it. Anybody, uh, if you can't afford 100 bucks, better find another business, okay? Do you like what you got today? That's the right answer. Okay, I got two more sessions. If you're interested, feel free to come to those. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience.